Welcome back to Real Estate Appraisal Principles and Procedures. This is your instructor, Matt Boxberger. And you can see I've decided to start labeling these sessions rather than weeks to reflect the online nature of the course and the fact that uh, you have the flexibility to do it at your schedule. So in session four, we'll cover the first part of chapter three of our book, uh, concerning the ownership of real estate. It actually starts with a short uh, update or refresher on what exactly an appraisal is, uh, followed by a discussion of real estate and real property, and then how the different ways that uh, land, which is a portion of the real estate, uh, is described. So just reviewing the learning objectives after we've finished this session, we'll be able to state what an appraisal is, to identify the, the components of real estate, and to list the considerations in determining whether an item is real property or personal property. Fixtures are the property that is most often in question and so we'll spend a good amount of time on discussing uh, whether an item is a fixture or not. We'll talk about the public and the private restrictions on the use of land and of real estate and then we'll be able to explain the different legal methods of describing the land. So as I said the first part of the chapter in this session covers the definition of an appraisal. And as the book says, the appraisal is a unique part of the real estate industry and the real estate transaction, particularly in that the appraiser has to be a disinterested or neutral party. I think everyone else in the transaction typically has an interest in whether the value is higher or lower based on their opinions and, and their interest in the transaction. But the, the appraiser's role is to be a, a trusted and objective determiner of the value. And therefore the appraisal has to be well supported and the value supportable by the data behind it because uh, the parties will have their interests and have to be confident in the value that the appraisal uh, expresses. And so we'll talk about what is an appraisal and we talked about USPATH, the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. They've got the definitions in there and I think the key thing to remember is that there are two definitions of appraisal. The first is the verb or the process and that's the act or the process of developing an opinion of value. So that's the, the work you'll be doing up to creating what is the second definition of appraisal, and that is the noun, the, the report. So there is the process, which is the appraisal process, and then there's the actual opinion of value, which is the appraisal report. And uh, again, kind of going back to what we covered in the first sessions, there's a number of different reasons that an appraisal may be required. Certainly the most common one has to do with making a lending decision, but there's other uh, reasons as well. Certainly uh, private uh, transactions, transfer of property or a portion of the property uh, between parties, uh, tax assessments, uh, so again, when we're talking about appraisal, we've got to remember that uh, it's not always for a, a loan. And so this is presented, I think, as an introduction and to say, since we're learning about the appraisal of real property or real estate, we have to understand what is real estate. And so then that leads us into the next portion of the chapter, which is real estate and what it includes. Certainly everyone I think understands the concept of the land. Uh, what's also important here is that when we talk about land that includes most of what's above and below the, the surface that you may stand on. And so one description I saw 
said think of the land as an inverted pyramid. If you've got a square piece of land, there's walls that go down in a pyramid shape to the center of the earth. So you own everything under the land to the center of the earth. And those walls go up to the heavens. And so you own everything above your land. Now, I said most of what's above because there are restrictions on the airspace. And, and as an aside, uh, the, the, the rights to own land or property ownership comes from the government, or they'll call that the sovereign, who owns or is, is responsible for uh, all of the land, so the United States, for example. And so, uh, as we'll talk about uh, later, the, the public restrictions, the, the government or the sovereign can uh, retain certain rights, and certainly they do that with, with air rights, for example, uh, planes flying over space rights. So, so there's some practical uh, limitations to this, although, again, another aside, uh, I know a few years back, there was some lawsuit from a state trying to restrict liquor service on airplanes flying overhead and I think that was quickly knocked down with the federal government saying that they retained those rights. But uh, importantly what's under the land can be uh, as valuable or more valuable than the land itself if there are mineral rights, oil for example. Uh, in addition there there's water rights uh, that can also be very valuable, that can be uh, part of the, the land as well. So real estate includes and starts with the land. Then there's also the concept of fixtures or attachments to the land and things that are incidental or appurtenant. Those are legal terms to the land and that includes uh, primarily things like easements which may be rights to use another piece of land for example the the neighbor's driveway to get to your piece of land so your piece of land can have an easement over some adjacent portion of land that will allow the owner of your land to travel over the adjacent land and so land that has or that, that gives uh, easements uh, can also have the value impacted significantly by the, the presence or the lack of that kind of easement. And then anything else that's considered immovable, and I think this is introduced as a counterpoint to, to crops. So for example, timber growing on the land or uh, seasonal crops although they're attached to the land, if you will, they're, they're an exception. They're called implements in the, uh, the legal term, and those are handled separately. So there's some, in a sale, for example, there's uh, a specific right to either harvest and, and get the profits from the, the crop by the, the current landowner, or that may be also uh, transferred as part of the sale of the land, but but the crops would be an exception and not uh, not considered part of the uh, of the the real estate. And then the final definition is site s i t e and differentiating a site from land. When land is improved by the addition of streets, uh, utilities, the, the water lines, gas lines, electricity, sewers, those kind of things that make it capable of supporting a, a building, then the term becomes a site or an improved site. So there's raw land and then there's a uh, site and the site has these utilities ready and in place. So. The next section has to do with fixtures and a specific kind of fixture called a trade fixture. And it starts with a definition of what is a fixture. It's anything that's permanently attached to the land and that can include natural things that are attached by roots such as trees, bushes, and man-made things such as buildings and fences. Ordinarily, those kinds of things are part
part of the land or the the property. If there's something like a hot tub above ground, hot tub in the background, where it may not be clear whether it is part of or permanently attached to the land, then there's legal tests. The courts use five tests to determine if something is a fixture. Uh, we'll scroll by here and then we'll talk about it, um, the, the five. The, the method of attachment, in other words, how permanent is it? Uh, with a building, there's a foundation and, and the, uh, the walls and so on are permanently attached. With the hot tub, uh, perhaps it's just setting on the grass or perhaps setting on a, a concrete slab but can easily be, be picked up and moved. So the, they'll look at what was the method of attachment. Uh, the adaptability of the item for the, the land's ordinary use. In other words, does it fit or work with, with the land? Is it, is it something that would uh, ordinarily be considered a part of the land? Then, more specifically, what was the relationship of the parties, the buyer and the seller? Uh, was there any intention discussed or uh, made clear or better yet a, a specific written agreement concerning that item like the hot tub is that uh, included in in the uh, the purchase price now when you're appraising the lender or the the parties typically want to know what is the value of just the real property that if there's any personal property that's not a fixture that that is excluded from the appraisal or that it is valued separately and then uh, subtracted from the total appraised value so that you have just the real property value. Let's take the uh, example of the bank. Uh, if that hot tub could easily be picked up and moved uh, without uh, causing a problem, the, the bank is not going to want that to be considered part of the appraised value. Uh, they're lending money assuming that if uh, the borrower is not able to pay it back that the, the bank will take possession of this property and be able to sell it to satisfy the debt. So uh, they'll want, and, and a part of an appraisal is to determine if there is personal property that should be excluded and uh, when you're appraising a house obviously things like the uh, the furniture and so on are, are clearly personal property and, and so the appraisal will will state that this is only the real property things in the kitchen like a portable microwave would be personal property and not included but if that microwave is part of the uh, the hood above the oven and, and permanently attached then that would be real property and uh, it's appropriate to include that in your appraised value of the of the real estate now trade fixtures are a specific category that typically are of concern when a, a property is leased. So if it's a building and a tenant brings in kitchen equipment or a, a service station brings in gas pumps, uh, shelving, those kind of things that were brought in by the tenant, those are considered trade fixtures. Now if those are permanently attached and not removed when the, the tenant leaves, then those become fixtures and part of the real property. But if they were brought in by the tenant and can be removed by the tenant, then the tenant has the right to do that, assuming they repair the holes in the wall or return the property to the the condition it was in before they put in their their trade fixtures and so again the agreement that's made will will govern or if not there's state laws that that are used to determine if an item that was a trade fixture becomes part of the the real property or not so next we'll talk about real property versus personal property and public versus private 
restrictions on the use of real property or real estate though so it comes in twos real versus personal and public versus private so we start with a little more detail first on real property and this is a fairly fine detail certainly in appraisal practice I haven't seen it come up in California but it's talking about the common law origins of the terms and saying that real property is essentially the same as real estate although sometimes property refers to this bundle of rights uh, which we'll talk about not not just owning the property but what you can do with the property but in practice real estate real property are synonymous and include both the uh, physical items and the rights uh, that you have with what you can do with those items and as we'll talk about in a second the uh, the limitations the public and private limitations on what you can do with with your real estate then a little bit more detail on personal property essentially personal property is everything that is not real property and the key area where you have to differentiate is trade fixtures you remember we said fixtures are real property they're attached trade fixtures start out as personal property the tenant brings them in to the property that they lease and then uses attaches them but if they can be unattached and taken away they remain the personal property of the tenant if they're left in place or can't be taken away without damaging or destroying the real property or if there was an agreement that those would become part of the the real property then then the trade fixtures uh, become become real property and become fixtures with that property so now we'll talk about restrictions on real estate and as I said there's two forms the public restrictions those that the government imposes or, or limits and then private restrictions those that uh, are specific to a property or group of properties public restrictions there are four categories of those taxation in other words the the government the the sovereign we mentioned that term earlier can impose taxes on the property so that you have to to pay taxes to retain ownership and and retain the usage of your real property eminent domain and escheat are the two ways that the government can take away property that is under private ownership eminent domain the concept where the property is condemned taken for a a public use and that a, a just compensation is paid to the person that has to uh, to give up their land and so this is a a specific area of appraisal practice of, of eminent domain work and the, the definition of value typically is different in an eminent domain case than in a market value case where market value would say typically the most probable value and eminent domain might say the the highest probable value for the the property uh, I'm sorry we'll finish this slide and then I'll get the uh, display back for us as cheat which is far more rare than eminent domain is the the power to take back land that's under private ownership if the owner dies and there's no heir named if they don't uh, deed it or, or will it to to someone else and so this goes back to the concept we mentioned earlier that ultimately the the sovereign or the government had the original ownership of all the land and can take it back and so occasionally with appraisal practice you'll go back to the original land grants or patents you'll see how the the land was originally given to the first 
private owners from the government and the restrictions there. You'll typically get into where you may want to subdivide land and, and there's restrictions on how far land can be subdivided. Over the years it may have been combined with different landowners buying uh, each other's land, but uh, it, it can be subdivided sometimes only back down to, to where it was uh, it was originally granted from the government. Um, and then the last uh, restriction or category of the four, and this one's fairly broad, the, what, what is called police power, although it's not always police that, uh, that enforce it, certainly uh, zoning and planning commissions, this is the most common, where there, there's restrictions about how high you can build, how close to the street you can build, uh, the type of, uh, of construction that uh, you can put on on property, so those are the common uh, police powers that that restrict what you can do with land, even though you have have full ownership of it. And then private restrictions, the the two main categories there are are liens, and the most uh, common lien is one for uh, what they call an equitable lien for the the equity where uh, if you borrow money, you uh, pledge that land or the property, uh, excuse me, as as collateral, and so that if you default, it can be foreclosed upon and 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 taken back. Um, then there's uh, liens that uh, the government can can impose because of unpaid property taxes, for example, or private judgments where a, an action can be brought uh, against a, a landowner, and they can be forced to to either pay or they can't sell the land or, or, or it can be forced to be sold to to satisfy that judgment. Uh, and then the other broad category is CC&Rs. I'm, you've heard of this I'm sure if you've owned a, a condominium, uh, but other kinds of developments will have these CC&Rs conditions, covenants, and restrictions on, on what can and can't be done uh, with, the, with the property. And certainly an unfortunate kind of, of restriction were ones that were put on uh, earlier in the 20th century, in the 19th century, that, that restricted who could live in a neighborhood, uh, you know, discrimination based on, on race or ethnicity. And so the government has said that any of those that were recorded, and you sometimes still see these in uh, the title of a property, but that it, it's declared invalid. Uh, so, so those could have have been in place, and others uh, in my part of of San Jose, the Berryessa region. There's a number of community pool associations, and so there's a uh, uh, an agreement, and it's actually a, a lien on the property that uh, that requires a, a payment uh, each year from the property owners to maintain these swimming pools uh, in in the area. So that's an, another form of private restrictions or, or requirements. Okay, so now we've got our screen back to, uh, to full here. So the next section we'll move into is the legal descriptions of land, and this will be the last portion of the lecture for this session number four. So there are three primary or basic methods of describing land that are in use in the United States. The first one, the lot and block system that you see here, is certainly the most common for uh, developed residential areas. Uh, the others are the meets and bounds system and the rectangular or government survey system. And so we'll talk about each one of those. Uh, the legal description is described in the book as one that uh, describes the land in such a way that a competent surveyor could locate its boundaries using nothing more than the description. Well, there's a little bit more than that, particularly the subdivision system. Uh, the description refers to books of maps, and so you would need to start from a map uh, in any event, but the actual division into lots and blocks or the tracts uh, 
is done as part of the, the subdivision process when land is being developed and so it's recorded in these um, in these books. So uh, the description you can see here on the slide uh, lot block and tract or subdivision system it takes individual parcels, individual pieces of land and then describes them by a, a tract number, a block number, and a lot number. And then there will also be the city and the county uh, that the property is located in and a book of maps and page number and a date because these are updated from time to time and so you need to start from the right uh, version of the map. And as we'll see in this example and others there is frequently a, a combination of the the three systems that, that are involved. Um, I've got at the bottom of this slide uh, legal descriptions from a couple of properties I had worked on. Uh, the first one that starts with parcel one and the, uh, the paragraph that starts with condominium. So this is a map, a plat map, that is a condominium development where there's not uh, individual lots, but it still talks of the condominium unit number and the, the map on page 49 and 50 of book 791 of the official records and it talks about when it was recorded in Santa Clara so you see that October 13th 2005 date so you can go it's public records and as we'll see in our uh, exercise and discussion question this week uh, appraisers typically no longer have to go to the courthouse and actually pull out the physical maps. It's it's digitized and, and much of it in many counties, although not all, can be reached online. And then the the second description down here is the more classic uh, lot and block and tract system description where it says lot 70 of tract 781. Lindenwood is the name of the development uh, and then it's got the book number 562, the page 24 and 25, and that it's recorded in Santa Clara County. So that is the, the first and, and the, the primary one that you'll see in appraisal practice for, for residential properties, the, the lot and block system. The next one is the meets and bounds system, and as you can see it says it's used primarily in the eastern states and so it's also an, an older system before the the third uh, system we'll see here the government survey system was put in place this this meets and bounds system was used and uh, as we'll also see as we look at plat maps there is a element of the meets and bounds that's, that's also used in doing a subdivision and, and so what those words mean and those are, are archaic words if there is a point of beginning or POB and that can be something like a tree or a post in the ground that so you, you start from this point of beginning and then you follow a boundary or a, a bound uh, a certain uh, length and a certain direction from that point of beginning and those distances or are called meets uh, and then it talks of individual monuments or markers so depending on on where the land is there may be uh, additional uh, things like the point of beginning additional points that that you will will move to and uh, again as it says this is, is primarily in use in the eastern United States but if you go to your book and look at page 77, the, the subdivision plat map that they've got there, you'll see a dot in the middle of the cul-de-sac and lengths and directions of the, the lines and, and lengths of the curves that, that, that define the, the boundaries of the lots there as well. So as you can see there there is a, a starting point, uh, a distance, and a direction associated with the uh, the boundaries of each of the uh, individual lots or each of the individual uh, pieces of land that are that are described there. And so here's an example of uh, 
the meets and bounds style of describing land from another assignment I worked on. And you can see this one has the point of beginning at the intersection of the center line of Arquez Avenue uh, with the monument line of Lawrence Expressway. And again, a surveyor would be able to find these. Uh, and it talks about a, a recorded map there. And as you continue down through this description, it will say thence, meaning the next step is along the center line of Arquez Avenue. And you, you go a distance and a direction. The direction is described first. That's the south 89 degrees 38 minutes 16 seconds east and the distance 171.60 feet. So the way this works on each of these calls as they uh, describe them is that you start if you're looking at the map uh, south so your arrow if you will is pointing south and from there you go 89 degrees 38 minutes 16 seconds east so if you can imagine an arrow spinning around it starts out pointing south but you pull it almost all the way to the east you go 89 degrees not quite 90 degrees if you're at 90 degrees you'd be pointing directly east so you're just a, a, a small amount uh, short of going directly east. So that's the direction your arrow is pointing and then the distance you go is 171.6 feet and then it describes where you'll arrive at. That's the end line of Arquez Avenue and then the next call they say thence along that said line, the end line of Arquez Avenue. Uh, again here's your direction and distance. So it's south. You start with your arrow pointing south and then you go just a touch east. Uh, now if you like uh, geometry you'll see that that makes a right angle. It's just a hair west of the south line and the first line was just a hair south of the east line. So, so you're going just about south but just uh, 0 degrees 21 minutes 48 seconds west and then the distance you go is 78.3 feet and it tells you where you'll arrive then this southerly line of Arquez Avenue and then the third call the vents along that last said line and you can see this is legally so it's it's complicated uh, I have had uh, tests on the um, the advanced, the, the certified general exam where you had to follow these and determine if it defined a, a complete uh, complete shape. So the, the, the next call is that, that uh, north and you'd start then with your arrow pointing to the north and then you'd go 85 degrees 4 minutes and 10 seconds to the east and you'd go a distance of 49.43 feet. So you can see how that works and you know these can be a lot longer if it's in a regular shaped uh, piece of land that's trying to follow a, uh, a road or a ridge line. Um, but, but that's the idea that a, that a surveyor with a map walking these things could stake out the exact boundaries of the land. So now the last uh, system of describing land is called the uh, rectangular or the government survey system. Uh, it uses sections and uh, townships. And again, this is fairly detailed. I think rather than you know put it on the slides and walk through it again, I'll just refer back to the uh, the book that starts on page 78. You will see this on appraisal tests. They like to, to get into the details that uh, township is 36 miles by, I mean 36 miles square, 6 miles by 6 miles. Uh, as you can see on page 79 of your book, there's a kind of unique numbering system so each of the sections within the township has a number from 1 to 36 but it starts in the upper right and goes from right to left uh, rather than left to right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I 
heard that this was so if a person was walking it, they would walk from 1 to 6, drop down and start on 7, go across 8 to 12, drop down again, start at 13. And so uh, th there's this unique numbering system. And then each of these sections is a, a square mile. So it's a mile on each side, 5,280 feet. And then it's further sliced into rectangles or squares, as you can see illustrated there. So a description might be the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter of section 3, 1414 range, 14 uh, township, uh, 14. And so with, with the township name and the section number and this description, the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter, you, you can divide that section down and, and determine which chunk it is that's being described. And again, I'll refer you to the book where it's got the examples. And if you look through that, you can see um, see how it's done. Now, uh, the surveyors uh, use these things called chains and rods, but I've never seen that level of detail on any of the tests I've taken. Uh, certainly knowing uh, how the township uh, is laid out and the section numbering is important, knowing uh, 5,280 feet to a mile and 43,560 square feet to an acre and 640 acres to a square mile. Those are the kind of things, as you can see, I've still got memorized because those pop up and tend to be the kind of oddball questions that you'll you'll see on an appraisal uh, exam, a licensing exam. And so my last example here from a um, an appraisal uh, that I had done uh, uses the uh, government survey system. You can see it talks about Township 14 South, Range 6 East, uh, and then it refers to the specific uh, meridian, the, the Mount uh, Diablo, the Mount Diablo meridian and baseline, and then the, the section numbers uh, 28 and 33. And so if you would go uh, to, the, um, to the example on page 79, you can see how section 28 and 33 actually touch. And so those sections were divided into two lots and um, they overlap those two sections. So uh, you would start with the, uh, the government survey and then you'd have to go to the, uh, the county uh, maps book to see the, uh, how the lots are, are laid out. So with that we'll wrap up the legal description of land and this much of uh, chapter, chapter 3 and then next week we'll start with the, uh, the legal rights and interests that can be held in real estate.